Well, hello, FCC fam. I know today you had to wait just a little bit longer to get a taste of what it is that God has for you today. But how many of you know, even though we might be delayed, we are not denied what God has prepared for us. I praise God. I'm ready to sit down at the Lord's table and to partake of the bread of life, uh, to, to drink of the living water. And I believe that you are ready in your homes as well. We encourage you to share this broadcast with your family, with your friends. Uh, give them an opportunity to be able to tune in. I believe I got a word from heaven today, and I can't say enough how excited I am. So let's get ready to pray. And uh, before we get ready to, uh, to, to pray, uh, I want to encourage you to be engaged. Uh, engaged, pretend like you're sitting right here in the service. Uh, you want to prepare your heart like God is getting ready to speak a word in due season right into your life that is going to impact your life and transform your life for the rest of your life. Amen. So let's, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you, we bless you, we thank you for the opportunity to come boldly to your throne that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And God, as we come today, we come in faith, we come trusting, and we come believing that both your grace and your mercy has been made available for us. Father, as we join ourselves in faith today, wherever we are, where people are in their homes or in their cars or, or out and about today, we just declare that God, wherever we are, wherever two or three are in agreement, there you are in the midst of us. So we believe, God, that your presence is here in this place today. We believe that you have set the table and are ready to feed us the word of God full of revelation, full of wisdom, full of understanding in a way that we can get it, grab a hold of it, and make it our own. We declare that the word has fallen on the good soil that produces 30, 60, and 100 times as much. And we declare today that this was the wrong church that the enemy should have ever messed with. We give you praise and we give you glory for every life that will be impacted and changed as a result of our gathering here today, being here in your presence and you answering this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody in agreement with this prayer said or type, amen. amen. All right. Well, listen, we have been in a series the last few weeks. This is part three, the final part of the series entitled God Has a Plan. God Has a Plan. So when people hear, you know, someone say God has a plan, oftentimes they think God is either working on something right now or God is scrambling to make things happen on their behalf. But, but technically when we look in Scripture, that's not necessarily true. I want to read to you a few passages. One from Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10 and another from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. In Isaiah 46 it says, earnestly remember the former things which I did of old for I am God and there is no one else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end and the result from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure and purpose. And then if we go over to Ephesians chapter chapter 2 verse 10 it says for we are God's own handiwork his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus born anew that we may do those good works which God predestined planned beforehand for us taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live so we talk about God having a plan and we look at it through the lens of Isaiah chapter 46 and Ephesians chapter 2. What this tells us is that God does not start anything until he finishes it. One of the names that describes who God is in scripture is he is the alpha and he is the omega. Which means he is the only being that can exist in the beginning and also in the end at the exact same time. Which means that he was there with Moses in the beginning when he, he breathed the word of God into his life and Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible but while he was all the way present in Genesis he was also all the way present with John when he was inspiring him to write the book of Revelation he's the only being that can exist in two different time being time periods at the exact same time so if God says something to us we hear it based on what's going on today but he said it based on what he's already seen in the end all right. So to kind of give an example of this, God is on a totally different time zone than us because he's not limited to time like we are. Now, if I were to use the, the, the country of Samoa as an example, Samoa is all the way on the other side of the world, on east of Australia. 
Samoa is 20 hours ahead of Arizona. So depending on when you're watching this broadcast right now in Arizona, it is, you know, the, the late morning and then, and then maybe early afternoon for some. But in Samoa, it's already Monday morning. So in Arizona, we're, taught, we're saying right now, Sunday's going to be a good day. Sunday is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. God, I'm excited, and I am in expectation for what you have for us on Sunday morning. But in Samoa, they're saying, God, we thank you for what you did on Sunday. We thank you that you, you moved mightily in our lives, and they're already starting to celebrate what God is doing on Monday. So in Samoa, they're rejoicing right now over something we haven't experienced yet in Arizona. So we're saying to God, God, help us get through this pandemic. But God is saying, I already saw you on the other side. I already saw people healed of this virus. I already saw the spirit of fear defeated in every nation around the world. I've already seen the Holy Spirit providing peace and comfort for those that are in need of it right now. I'm here to tell you today that God has a plan and it's not a new plan. It is a foreordained plan. Because when this pandemic hit, nothing about God's old plan needed to be updated. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the plan he had in place is a plan that worked in the past. It is a plan that will work presently. And it is a plan that will work for everything that's coming up down the line. I need you to say or type amen to that today. Now we talked about how the Bible is three things. The Bible is a history book of God's past dealings with man. It is an instruction manual about how you and I are supposed to live our lives today. And it is also a book of prophecy that foretells future events that have yet to come to pass. All three of these provide us with direction, provide us with instruction. And when you decide that you are not only going to believe but live according to the scripture, prophecy can be a great source of peace and comfort uh, in times of crisis like this. Now, the Bible also tells us there is nothing new under the sun. There is no temptation that has taken us, but such as is common to man. Now, I know that we might feel like we are living in unprecedented times. And, and, and it's true. What we are experiencing right now is nothing that we have ever seen in our generation. But I do need you to understand this is not the first time that pestilence or the first time a pandemic or the first time that famine has ever hit the earth. And I'm telling you, the same God that ushered previous generations through pandemics, through disease, through pestilence, is the same God that is going to usher our generation through this where we come out on the other side all said and done. Amen. I want you to say this with me. Say, God has a plan. Come on, say this with me. Say, God has a plan that is for me, but is not all about me. We about to go there today. Come on, we about to go there today. Say that with me. Say, God has a plan, God has a plan. That, is that is for me, but is not all about me. All about me. Ooh, let's go over to Matthew chapter 25. Let's dig into this. All right. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14. We're going to read verses 14 through 18, then we'll drop down to verse 24 and read through verse 29. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground, and hid the master's money. Drop down to verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you. Were a harsh man, harvesting crops you did not plant, and gathering crops you did not cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more 
will be given. Come on, you ought to grab a hold of that right now. If you are a faithful steward and you use well what has been given to you, even more will be, will be given and you will have abundance. Now, in this passage, we, we, of course, you know, this story, Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. All right, we look at the, the, the man that went on the long journey is no different than Jesus, you know, leaving his, uh, leaving, uh, sending the Holy Spirit to, to be with us, him going on a long journey, and of course, we're going to be reunited with Jesus again. Everything that we have, the gifts, the graces have been distributed as a result of what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection. All right, so when he went on this long journey, he left each of us with talents. And in this passage, uh, it obviously uses the, the term bags of silver. But what I want you to, I want to focus on in this passage is, is when it says, I was afraid, so I hid. Say that with me. Say, I was afraid, so I hid. Now, are we supposed to be at home right now, only going, leaving our homes for essential reasons, according to the CDC? Yes, we are. But according to the kingdom of God, Though we are at home, we're not supposed to be hiding the talents that we have. See, what are you doing with your talents to help others while you're at home? Fear caused this one talent servant to hide something that he had the ability to produce with. See, the talents that you have, that the talents that you have been given, have been given to you by God, and not only are they exactly what you need for your life, they are also perfect for the times that you and I are living in today. Now, there are a few sovereign decisions that God does not consult us on when he made them. Number one, we don't get to decide what family we're in. Number two, we don't get to decide what race we're going to be. Number, number three, we don't get to decide what sex we are when we're born. But then also, we don't get a chance to decide when we are born, and where we are born. So just the fact that you are here now, that you were born in this time, here in 2020, just the fact that you are here in this moment, I believe the kingdom has called you into the earth for such a time as this, and the earth needs the talents that live on the inside of you. And this is why the enemy wants to use this time to get so many people in fear because he cannot guard everybody. I think so oftentimes we, we understand that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. But sometimes we seem to forget that we fight against an enemy that has already been defeated. We fight against an enemy that does not have the same qualities that God does. God is omnipresent, which means he can be in all places at the same exact time. Satan does not have that same capability, so, which means that in order for him to be effective, he's got to get some people in self-check. And I'm going to tell you, when we live in fear, we live in self-check. Because fear by nature only looks out for himself. And what we see here looks out for itself. So here in this passage, we saw in Matthew chapter 25 that the servant that had one talent, because he was afraid of mismanaging the talent that he had, he dug a hole, he hid what his master gave him, and watch this, he not only never reached his full potential, he also never got a chance to experience the opportunities that would have come had he not been afraid, had he not hid his talent, and had he not dug a hole and put what, what his master gave him into the earth. And so what happens is that fear prevents us from living up to our full potential. So you are supposed to be at home right now, but you are not supposed to be hiding the talents that God has given you even though you are at home. We've been home, we've been home now for a few weeks, and I believe it's time for us to start, you know, even shifting our prayer a little bit to start asking God, how can I use my talents right now to help others? Because if I've been called into the kingdom and I've been born in the earth for such a time as this, then it's time for us to believe that the talents that we've been given is something that the earth is in need of right now, even though we have been told we need to stay home right now. For some of you, for example, you give great financial advice. 
And, and listen, right now, some people could use some solid financial advice about some things that they need to do right now and, of course, over the next few weeks or months. Some of you are a great voice, you know, that could usher people into the presence of God. And how many of you know in times of, of stress and anxiety, what people need, whether they know it or not, is the presence of God. What happens when we get all the singers and the worship leaders online and get them singing not only during the church service but also throughout the week so that people can begin to settle and and their stress can be eased as they're ushered into the presence of God. Because see, in the presence of God, you're more conscious of what you do have than you are of what you don't have. When you're in the presence of God, you're not just conscious of what's going on with you. You're conscious of who he is. And how many you know right now people need the presence of God more than any, any other time? Some of you uh, are, are, inner, are intercessors. You're a prayer warriors. You could pray the paint off the wall. Amen. And right now when people don't know what to pray and don't know what to say, they can use an intercessor who can ride on, the, on your coattails into the presence of God so that they can experience his presence and get their petitions up to him. For some of you, you got cooking skills that would cause people to fall out under the power. And right now we're at home and we're cooking more than probably many of us have cooked in years. And watch this, some people could use some of your cooking school skills just to be a blessing to them and to their family right now. For some of you, you, you know, you're a mom and you have mastered homeschool and could really help some other moms not to feel so overwhelmed as they have not, as, as they've shifted not only from just being a mother, but also to, their, to being their children's teacher right now. For some of you, you know, your, your marriage is the bomb.com. And so you could help a whole lot of people that find themselves at home now with a spouse that they don't like. So they could use some of your tips that you have to offer on how to strengthen that marriage relationship and deal with some of the issues that maybe have been swept under the rug over the last few months or so. Some of you, your family just rocks and people would just be blessed just to be able to take a peek into your family life and just see, you know, how healthy your interactions are and how much love there is between you and the other people that live with you. For some people, you're very private, and, but when you speak, people listen. How much of a blessing would it be for people to hear from someone that they know doesn't maybe spend a whole lot of time online? How much would it bless them to hear your voice right now? For some people, you're, you're, you're single, but yet you have learned how to be hungry for God and not thirsty for other people. You've learned how to fulfill purpose, how to be driven, how not to be preoccupied by the distractions of this age. How many single people could use the wisdom and the experience and the, and, and the things that you've learned from God over the years right now? How many of you are, I have mastered scheduling and how to organize your home and how to hold people accountable. And some of you have a business acumen that, man, could be a blessing to many people and I think that in this season nobody wants to see someone else capitalize on someone else's misfortune which is why I think it's more powerful than in any other time for us to approach this with a servant's mentality Jesus said if you want to be great in this kingdom you've got to be willing to be a servant and I think that, you know, we don't need to be focused on trying to monetize everything right now so much as we need to be focused on finding ways to serve other people. And you'll be surprised how what starts off as a mustard seed, the Lord will end up growing into something that's so great that not only does it bless other people, but it also blesses you and takes care of your household as well. So I want you to understand this. You are supposed to be at home according to the CDC, but according to the kingdom, you are not supposed to be hiding the talents that you have. Number two, what, you are, what are you doing with your talents to help others while you're at home? And then number three, third thing I want you to get from this is God has a plan that is for you, but it is not all about you. Go with me over to Matthew chapter 5. If you're getting some notice today, shout or type, amen. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read verses 13 through 16 from the message translation. It says, let me tell you. Why you are here. Now, this is the hood version, so I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this one. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in this world. God is not a secret to be kept. 
we're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine, brother, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Be opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So notice, folks, what it tells us. It says, that, look, we are here to be salt, and we are here to be light. And God said, do you think if I made you a light bearer that I'm going to put you in hiding? So why says, just because you're at home doesn't mean you're supposed to be in hiding. Your light's supposed to be shining as much at home as it is in all of the other places. And if you got to find a way on how to get the light outside of your house, I'm encouraging you right now to find a creative way to get what's going on on the inside of you out of your house because although you are at home, God doesn't want to keep what he's doing on the inside of your heart a secret. Praise God. Amen. Go with me over to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We need to shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. This little light, this big light, this medium-sized light, whatever kind of light you have, let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. It says, to everything, there is a season. Oh, I'm excited about this right now. To everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. I need you to understand that purpose is still alive even during a pandemic. Now, when you think about purpose, some wisdom we can, we can draw from this. When you think about purpose... Don't just think about what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. Because what Ecclesiastes tells us in this verse is that purpose sometimes can be seasonal. Yeah. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. So the same way that many companies have seasonal workers, there are times when God will assign seasonal tasks to individuals that they won't be doing for the rest of their life, but they will be doing for a season in order to fulfill a particular purpose. Now, oftentimes, we confuse pace with purpose. So we think the only people fulfilling purpose are those that are moving at a fast pace. And, and, and it makes me think about the story in, in the Gospels when Lazarus had died. And you remember they came to Jesus with a sense of urgency. Lord, you got to come. You got to come right now. You got to come right now. Lazarus is not doing good. He's going to die. And then Jesus, taking his, taking his time, was not in any rush to get to Lazarus' house. Well, eventually the word gets back. And they said to him, it's too late now. He's died. Jesus makes this statement. Didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And they're like, okay, Lord, I hear you, but he's been dead four days, and behold, now he stinks. And I want you to see that God is never moved by what time it is. When God has a set schedule for when he wants to see happen, nothing moves him outside of the schedule that he has because he knows his timing is perfect. And even though Jesus showed up at a time, you know, Jews believed, the Jews believed at that time that the spirit had hung around the tomb for three days. So the fact that Lazarus was dead for four days, in their eyes, they felt it was too late. But what they didn't realize is that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. That even when things are dead, it's still not too late for God. And so Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead because he understood my purpose is not limited to my pace. As a matter of fact, I would dare to say that it, sometimes it takes more faith to move slower than it does sometimes to, than it does take faith to move at a very fast pace. And to kind of give me an example of this, you know, as we get older, and this is, this is different for all of us, but as we get older, life at some point is going to slow down. At some point, it's, it's going to slow down. 
But when you're used to go, 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 go. When you're used to go, 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 going at a hundred miles an hour all of the time, what's important is that when work, ministry, life, or business slows down, you have to pivot and find purpose again. Man, I'm preaching better than y'all typing or saying amen right now. Because some people know their pace better than they know their purpose. What are you doing? I don't know, but I know I got to do this at 2 o'clock. I got to do it at 3 o'clock. I got to do it at 4 o'clock. I got to do it at 5 o'clock. I got to do this at 6 o'clock. I got to do this at 7.30. I got to do this at 8 o'clock. Boy, my day is busy. Well, why are you doing all that? Well, I don't know why I'm doing it, but that's just all that I got. That's, that's all that I know I have to do. So they know their, their pace. They know their schedule better than they know their purpose. And I've seen people lose sight of their purpose during a slowdown because they thought the slowdown meant that they were no longer needed. But it's during a slowdown when you are supposed to be proving more than ever how necessary you are. Employers can lay off employees, but what employers cannot do is eliminate purpose. Because the only being that can give you purpose is God. We think if we don't have a job, I've lost my purpose. But your employer can't give you purpose. Your employer can only give you a job. Which means that even if you lose your job, you never lost your purpose. And because you never lost your purpose, even in a slowdown, doesn't mean you are not necessary. And, and I'm going to tell you, right now is the time that you want to be proven more than ever how necessary your talents and your gifts are. Joseph, after coming out of a prison, Pharaoh ended up having a dream, and Joseph had enough sense to show Pharaoh how necessary his talents were going to be over the next 14 years as the Lord began to unfold and unveil the vision that had been given to him. And even right now, if you feel like your role on your job has slowed down, now's not the time for you to just be chilling at home. Now's the time for you to be showing your employer how necessary you are through creativity and ideas. And even if it's just you being an encouraging voice to your other teammates, you want to be showing people that even though my role might have shifted, I have pivoted in the midst of pace slowing down, found purpose, and I'm showing everybody that I'm working with how resourceful I am even in the midst of change. Come on, you want to be like Moses' staff. Moses, Moses, when he had a staff, God told him that, you know, this is, he, he told him, I want you to take that staff in, and then when you get before Pharaoh, throw it down on the ground, I'm going to turn it into a snake. Pick it back up again, I'm going to turn it into a staff. And then when you get to the Red Sea, stick it out amongst the Red Sea, and the Red Sea is going to split on both sides. And see, you don't want to just be an individual that's only got one trick up your sleeve. And all you can be is a staff. No, you want to be someone who can change in a moment. You want to be someone who can adjust and adapt to the times. You want to be someone who can be used by God no matter what situation you are in because you believe I've been called into the kingdom for such a time as this and my purpose still has validity even though life has appeared to slow down right now. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says that he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before time began. I don't know if you just heard what I said. Your purpose even predates time. God gave you purpose before time began. What came first, you know, the chicken or the egg? It's kind of like that. God gave you purpose before he ever put time in the earth. So to kind of give an example of this, uh, about a person's life slowing down, but him still not losing sight of his purpose. John the Baptist made the statement that he was the one that was supposed to prepare the way for the one who was coming. So when Jesus came on the scene, after John had been the one prophetic voice that Israel heard after a 400-year silence. When Jesus came onto the scene and John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. Did John abandon his purpose when he decreased? 
Not at all. But what he did do is he adjusted his pace and he adjusted his platform so that his purpose was still relevant when Jesus was here. And folks, this is what our job is. Our job is to take the purpose, the talents that we have been given and to begin to believe God to ask him how to adjust and adapt our talents for the time and the season that we're in. And watch this. I'm not just speaking to younger people. I'm speaking to the older generation as well. If you, are, if you still have life on the inside of you, you still have a purpose for being here in the earth. And we need to stop looking at the world as a world that doesn't fit the gifts and the graces you've been given. No, what happens is that you've got a purpose that is eternal in nature. But you've got to have a strategy that fits the day and age that we live in today. And if you need help with the placement of your hands so that you know what to bless and what not to bless, then you need to engage some younger people if necessary so that you can stay relevant in the times that we're living in today. Go with me over to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to begin reading at verse number 8. It says, then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sodom. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God, that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and only a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. Then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised Elijah. So I want you to, to see that the Lord told Elijah, after the brook had dried up, he said, I have, I've spoken to or, or, or I've dealt with a woman in Zarephath, you know, that she's going to be the one that I'm going to use to sustain you now that my previous source of provision has dried up. And watch this, before we even get into this story, you need to grab a hold of that right now. When one river or brook dries up, God always has the next step for you. Sometimes when you don't see it, you just need to go pray about what it is so that if you can't see it with your natural eyes, he can show you what it is with your spiritual eyes. There's no way Elijah just would have figured this out with his own understanding. He needed a rhema word from God about what to do in this season. And watch this. God didn't just tell him, you know, I want you to, uh, you know, to go to a particular city. He also said, I want you to go to this city and there's a particular kind of woman, a widow woman who I have commanded to sustain you there. Now, when the Lord says things like, you know, I've commanded this person to sustain you, you would think that the Lord has already had this conversation with that individual. Isn't it a trip when the Lord tells you something and you just think, ma'am, I bet you the Lord has already dealt with this other individual about it, and then you go and initiate, you know, dialogue and conversation with this person, and it's like you're the one that knows about it, but the other person don't know anything about it. So you would think when Elijah showed up on the scene, saw the widow woman, the widow woman would have been like, yes, I've been praying these last few days, and I had you in my spirit like I was supposed to do something for you. I was supposed to look out for you. But when Elijah and this widow woman came into contact with each other, it was clear this woman didn't have any any clue about what was going on with Elijah and what she was supposed to do concerning him. So, and it just goes to show that God's provision for our lives sometimes will remain dormant until it's activated by faith. I said, well, did God deal with her or did he not deal with her? He dealt with her, but he dealt with her in the spirit. And it wasn't until Elijah 
did what he knew to do, that she would be activated in order to fulfill her role in his particular, in his life. So the first thing Elijah did was he asked the widow woman to do something for him. He said, bring me some water, and while you're, while you're fetching the water, I want you to bring me some bread as well. Well, why is that? Because when people are in fear, self-preservation is their first priority. So the only way you can get people out of fear is you have to redirect them out of self-preservation, get their minds off themselves, and get their mind on somebody else. And you can hear the desperation in this woman's story. I swear by the Lord your God, I don't have a single piece of bread in my house. As a matter of fact, the, the, all I have is a handful of meal, a little bit of oil in a jug. Me and my son are getting ready to eat our last meal, and we're going to die. And Elijah could have said, girl, God's got you. Girl, God will provide. Girl, the Lord has a ram in the bush the way he had a ram in the bush for Abraham. I'm preaching better than you saying amen with a woman. God has got you. I just need you to hold on to his unchanging hand. Elijah could have said a lot of stuff. But the first thing, Elijah said to this woman, after hearing her story, was don't be afraid. And watch this. Maybe after, after hearing his first request to not only get him some water, but to get him some bread, just maybe Elijah didn't understand her whole situation because he had just met her. But now she's told him. I'm down to my last handful of meal, down to my, my last bit of oil. Me and my son are getting ready to eat our last meal that we have before we pass. So it can almost kind of sound like Elijah lacks empathy and is not being considerate of what this woman's needs are by now asking for, for her to get something for him first before she serves herself and her son. You would almost kind of think, that this woman would say to Elijah, I don't think you heard what I said. I said, I'm down to my last meal for me and my son. Then we're going to die. And now you just asked me to make you a cake first and then eat. And then me and my son will eat. And I'm trying to figure out how this is going to work. I don't have enough food for two people. And now you want me to provide food for three people. And I just think that we need to tap back in to some of our grandmothers and great-great-grandmothers who could take a little bit and turn it into a meal that not only took care of you, but somehow, some way, was able to feed the whole entire neighborhood. And I mean, you know, God can show you when you have limited resources in your hand how to multiply what you have in your possession to not only your need is met, but also the needs of many other people is met as well. And so Elijah told the widow woman, do what I said, but make me a little cake first. And the reason why he had to ask her to do this is because he had to activate her faith first. If Elijah did not activate this widow woman's faith, then what would have happened is that, and, and he would have just jumped right to the miracle. You know, give me, give me the handful of meal, give me the oil, you know, and then alacadabra, uh, Bada bing, bada boom, alakazam, boom shakalaka, water tie. Enjoy. Yummy. If he would have jumped right to the miracle and not addressed and confronted her fear, then every time dinner time came around, he would have been managing her fear over the next year if he doesn't confront her fear before he releases the miracle. So he's got to deal with her fear to get her out of self-preservation. And that's what faith does. God will have you take a faith step that will get your mind off of you and get your mind on somebody else. And watch this. You know, sometimes when all you have is all you got, it ain't like what you have is going to be enough to take care of you anyway. Then what you want to do in that moment is go ahead and sow a seed wherever you can and just believe that your seed is going to end up meeting your need. Now, what I want you to see from the story is that God brought two people together who were in dire need to meet each other's need. One person had a word from God, but...
but didn't have the means to bring it to pass. Another person had the means but didn't have a word from God. So God brought together a person who had a word and a person who had the means. And when they both came together, they prevented each other from starving to death. So who is starving in the world for what you have? Who's God trying to connect you with so that you can help them and so that they can help you? It's time for us to come out of hiding and it's time for us to start asking God, who can I help? Who can I partner with? I need to get my, my talents out of hiding even though I'm in my house so that somebody else can receive from what it is that God has given to me. I want you to point at somebody, point at something in your house, whether it's your couch, your dog, your cat, your cousin, your brother, your sister, your mama, your spouse, your child, and tell them I'm coming out of hiding. I'm coming out of hiding. Last verse over in Acts chapter 20, and we close with this. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. I think we need to be reminded of this today. Paul said, in everything I've pointed out to you by example, that by working diligently in this matter, we ought to assist the weak, being mindful of the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed, makes one happier, and more to be envied to give than to receive. Now, Jesus did not say, you won't be blessed by receiving. What he said it is that if you lined up giving and receiving next to each other, you have more opportunities to be blessed by giving than you ever will just by receiving. It's a blessing to receive an answer to prayer. It's even more of a blessing to be the answer to somebody's prayer. It's a blessing to receive a word, but it's even more of a blessing to be in a position where God is using you to give the word to somebody else. It's a blessing to receive a gift, but it's even more of a blessing to be the one that God uses to give a gift to somebody else. You can have a good time by receiving, but you can have an even better time when you start asking God how to take what you have been given so that you can be a blessing onto somebody else. I believe that God is, because our, our message has kind of shifted a little bit on this week, but I think it's, it was time. I think it's time now that we are starting to feel some level of normalcy. That though we are in our homes, we are not hiding in our homes. But we are looking for ways for God to use us to be salt and to be light to a world that is in need of it today. I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I just thank you for the message that you had dropped on the inside of my heart today and the grace that you gave me to be able to deliver it. And God, now my prayer today is that people will not just hear this message and say that it was a good word, but that people will hear this message and begin to act on the things that you are dealing with their hearts about. Though we have been encouraged to remain in our homes, God, that doesn't mean that our influence and our impact still can't reach all around the world. God, it was even the Apostle Paul, uh, I remember reading the book of Acts, when he was, he, was, he was on house arrest, but yet he still invited people to his house and preached the gospel to them. God, give us creative, innovative ways for us to use what you are doing in our homes and get the message and the life of what we are experiencing out into the world today. We thank you and we give you praise for your creativity, for the innovation that lives on the inside of people. God, I thank you that it's in moments like this that we all look for things, that ways that we can do things differently so that purpose can still be fulfilled. I pray that the slowdown is helping people to pivot, God, and refocus on what their purpose is during this time so that you can still use them to be a blessing onto many others. And listen, if you're watching this broadcast today and maybe you're, you're, you don't know Christ or you have never given your heart to Jesus and you want to do so today, you say, I, I believe I, I'm here for a purpose, but I don't know what that purpose is. Well, listen, if you want to know what your purpose is, you've got to go back to the one that created you so that you can find out exactly what it is. So if you're in here today and you want to invite Christ into your heart, into your life, I want to say a prayer for you. 
Maybe you're, 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 you're watching and you say, Pastor Moore, I, I need to recommit my life, rededicate my life to God today. I'm, I, I'm backslidden, I've fallen away from the Lord, but today I was encouraged, I was admonished, and I want to come back home. I want to recommit my life to Him. Well, listen, get in on this prayer today and, and don't let this moment pass you by. If you don't know Christ and you need to rededicate your life, I want you to pray this with me today. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the son of God that he died on the cross and shed his blood for my sins Jesus come into my heart come into my life and save me today I ask that you forgive me of my sins cleanse me from all unrighteousness God I want to live for you I want to live a life filled with purpose I want to li live a life that fulfills the destiny that you have for me God I receive your love and I receive your forgiveness today I give you thanks for what you're doing in my heart for what you're doing in my home in Jesus mighty name listen if you pray with me today I want to say congratulations congratulations on making an eternal decision I truly believe that your life will never ever be the same if you tune in for today's broadcast and maybe you are a first time visitor a uh, first time guest if you prayed that prayer today you know type the word uh, connect uh, there on your screen or I encourage you to, to uh, let us know that maybe you received Jesus. Maybe you can type that in the feed, like I received him today, or, you know, I, I recommitted my life, I rededicated my life. Whatever you need to do to let us know. Let us know about the decision that you made today so that someone from our team can reach out and touch you. I just want to say congratulations, and uh, I hope you got something out of this broadcast today. Uh, I hope God spoke something into your heart and into your life that now has got you challenged to now lead when you turn this broadcast off to start asking God, God, how can I stop hiding my talents and, then, and instead use my talents to make an impact in the world? I want you to know, Pastor Eric and I, we love you dearly. Uh, we love you with all of our hearts. The staff loves you, all of our volunteers. Uh, we miss you guys tremendously. Uh, cannot wait until we can actually come back and fellowship again as a church. Yeah, I've been saying the last few weeks, when we come back, we're going to party like it's 1999. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're going to party like it's 2020. But any, anyhow, we're going to have a great time. But until then, listen to me. Let's not focus on what we can't do. Let's focus on what we can do. And let's enjoy what we do have right now. Uh, we encourage you to share this, uh, share this broadcast. Uh, like us on Facebook. Follow us on the Instagram uh, so that you can stay abreast of everything that's happening here at Faith Christian Center. From my heart to yours, I want you to know I love you with everything that I have, and I will see you soon.